Good evening, welcome to the monastery again. And uh, also to take up some of the questions that are raised by people who write in. By the way, for those of you who might recognize that I'm wearing my Ned Levin style uh, school for this evening with, uh, with due respect to you, Father Gregory, if you're out there somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> the um, question that was asked you know, we always have people who are panicked about some downward spiral in humanity. The ironic thing is that despite all of the going on in the world today, we live in the most, one of the most peaceful eras in human history. And I know that's difficult to, to grasp. Yet violent crime rates in, in the Western world are down substantially, particularly from from the 1980s, but just in general. Uh, in, in the 1800s, the per capita crime rate was higher and went down during the First World War in most Western societies, perhaps largely because all the young men were in the military. To remind me, during the First World War, was really quite destructive in Europe. And yet, in the 1600s, during the Thirty Years' War, which was between two Christian denominations, 40% of the population of Europe died, a greater percentage than died in the First World War in Europe. But actually, the violence had down somewhat. <clears throat> and the, but the other part of this uh, question, where people see some something to get a little bit panicked or hysterical about in a given era in our history. I want to talk about two of those right now. And I've said before that one of the primary causes of modern atheism is Christian fundamentalism. Now Christian fundamentalism, I, I know how it began in the 1800s with the uh, revivalist movement and all that. That isn't what it is today at all. Christian fundamentalism is always very negative, sort of panicky about, always trying to find a scapegoat for practically everything. And among the worst frauds in our recent era was Dr. Dobson and his family movement, because Dr. Dobson was much like the fascists, trying to find a scapegoat that he could, and he could manipulate people's minds through this scapegoat in order to raise a lot of money. And he was talking about the decline in the American family, had a branch in Canada that uh, complained about a similar decline here. But really the problem is the decline in the nuclear family was a result of the Great Depression and the Second World War. It was not because of any international conspiracy or national conspiracy. It was not because of any particular group in society. It was really the result of the war. Now when we have a dislocation as great as the Second World War, the First World War wasn't really a world war. The Second World War, which encompassed the Pacific region as well as the Atlantic region, this was a genuine world war, and the dislocation was enormous. The uh, difference between the two is, people my age saw the Second World War taking place full screen in the movies. It, we had movie told news, there was Pathé, Grumman World News, all of these others, so it was very immediate to us. And the other thing is that at the end of the Second World War, in the communities around military bases or arms factories where a lot of women had to be pressed into working in, the, in these factories. By the end of the war, maybe 50% of the women under the age of 25 were widows and had children. So this enormous demographic change is what we're going to talk about. And this is a part of our discussion about law, ethics, and morality, and the clash that often takes place between them. Now, nothing takes place, there, 
these huge changes in society and social views don't really take place suddenly. They take place a little more gradually, like a tsunami developing as it moves across the water before it builds up to hit the shore. And the reason I have a board here, I, I said something about the tsunami. And in order to make what I'm going to say a little more comprehensible, I'm going to show you something about tsunamis and what, how they build up and what makes them so dangerous. In the, uh, a tsunami is caused by some geological event, maybe an underwater landslide of some huge proportion, the breaking of, of uh, the plates underground and when one is thrust up and the other down, or a, a, a huge earthquake. The uh, tsunami we had a few years ago that did such destruction along the Indian Ocean was an earthquake. But when a plate tone breaks, thrust up, and forces a huge amount of water to be displaced, displaced. all of these uh, events displace a huge amount of water. So what you get is this, this upwelling of this huge amount of water that's been displaced. And then it begins to ripple across the surface of the sea at speeds up to several hundred kilometers per hour. Well, it, it's, you don't notice it too much in the open ocean because it's just a few ripples. Now what happens when it gets close to the land? The front end of this hits the land and immediately slows down, but the water behind it is still traveling at several hundred kilometers an hour, so it collides with the slowed down water, forces it up, and rides up over it as well. And so you get tsunamis sometimes 30 or 40 feet high that crashes ashore and then, of course, destroys everything in front of it. But what's actually happening is this ripple of water is unnoticeable while it travels across the middle of the ocean. Only when the front part of it is suddenly slowed down by striking land and the rest of it moving at the same speed collides with that, then it forces it up and you have the tsunami situation. Now the reason I want to mention this is because sometimes we see something as occurring suddenly, instantly, but it's been rippling across the sea of life or the sea of society for some time, and then it collides with something, and you see the tsunami effect of social change as well. Now, the Second World War was quite sufficient, but sometimes the things that we dogmatize or teach can be the landfall upon which this water strikes. Because I'm going to discuss the dislocations that took place in the, end of, in the latter part of the 1950s through the 1985 or so, when we had an upsurge in crime, violent crime, and why we did. <clears throat> I'm also going to discuss what Christians, particularly the fundamentalists, sometimes do that helps create these tidal waves. There's an upsurge, there's been an upsurge in atheism in the last two decades in particular, maybe three decades, starting, starting the age really. And I'm just going to give one simple example, but a very profound example, as to why this picked up speed at that particular time, and why we saw this huge change, social change, when the AIDS epidemic was identified, really in the 80s, it had been going on since part of the 70s, immediately uh, in, in America, it was noted that it had spread more rapidly or spread among the gay community and the intravenous drug using community. There's a connection <clears throat> there as well. So right away, fundamentalist preachers began to say that AIDS is God's punishment on the gay community. And God sent this plague to punish that particular community. Well, it wasn't long before intelligent people began to notice that the vast majority of people with AIDS were heterosexuals. Enormous number of them were infants and children. A great number of them were women who were forced into prostitution or raped in parts of the world where that's still quite common practice. It happens uh, in Thailand, of course, but throughout large parts of Africa. 
where the AIDS epidemic actually began. So what was the question now that was raised in the minds of this younger generation who were experiencing this transition? Did God actually engineer the AIDS transition as, as the biggest voices in Christianity were saying? And if he did, how come he couldn't control that if he'd engineered it? Why did it not just strike the people he engineered it in order to punish? Why does it strike all of these innocent people? These children, these infants who could have done nothing wrong, or women who have no choice about whether they had sexual relations or not. Uh, women who were sold into prostitution, women who were raped by uh, men in, in certain parts of Africa, this takes place quite a lot. Rebel forces, for example, will march into a village in Congo or someplace and of course rape all the women and the young girls. We saw that in Darfur, where eight-year-old girls were being raped, sometimes raped to death, by, uh, by these troops. So if God created and engineered this punishment for a specific community, and he's all-powerful, why could he not control it? Why did all these innocent people begin to suffer? So this little tsunami, this little ripple of water now strikes land and starts to form this tidal wave. What else are fundamentalists saying that make God look really bad? that make God look like the sort of person that if you did believe in him, you'd want to see him before the Hague International Court for war crimes or crimes against humanity. So this is the problem that I want to touch on just a little, where we have this clash between, um, I'd say, morality, ethics, and law, but also between religion and civilization. Not all Christians believe these sort of things, of course. But the ones who had the loudest and biggest voices did. And they created a serious problem. Then people start talking about the war on drugs, why violence had increased in this period of time from latter 50s, say 57, through to about 84, 85, when it began to taper off again. <coughs> this sort of dislocations of the Second World War, but also the propaganda that went on during the war, and some of the preaching that went on as well, but a lot of the propaganda. We were taught how to tell a dirty Jap from our Chinese friends. Then suddenly the Japanese became our friends after Mao Zedong uh, won in China, and it was the dirty chinks against our Japanese friends. Well. You see, the waves are rippling across. First of all, the Second World War disoriented a whole generation who had come through the, through the Depression and families had already broken apart because of the Depression, broke apart more because of the Second World War. But the disorientations of the Second World War, in a period of war, there are certain things that generally considered immoral that take a, a spike. And they take a spike partly from fear, partly from despair, partly from depression, and partly because when there's a, something like a war, sexual passions are actually increased. Not because demons are whispering in people's ears or people have become less moral, but because there's a natural evolutionary process that makes us want to repopulate when masses are being killed off. So, and of course it is the, the desire for procreation that feeds or starts sexual passions. And obviously we try to keep it from getting out of hand. But during the war, in a great period of, of death and everything, there's a natural reaction. And so we have this, this, this kind of rise. But the war itself had wrecked so many families and left people with single parent families and change the economy so that mothers and fathers both had to work for the most part. All these things changed. But we also had a younger generation born during the war, many of whom, like myself, remembered many aspects of the war, coming of age at the very time when television had become popular and communications 
had become more instant and when you could see what was going on pretty well in the rest of the world and there developed a common culture fed by television to a certain degree, fed by the war, a common culture among the younger generation and this common culture was built on a disoriented generation but also on a youth generation and one of the problems of this kind of uh, destabilizations in society, such as wars and depressions and things, when you get a lot of children born in a given era, now this was almost pre-baby boomer, when you get a lot of younger generation brought up in, in such a disoriented or shattered world, young people in general do not have the full capacity for the control of their energies and passions because the brain doesn't fully develop and one of the more critical parts of the brain, the frontal cortex, the frontal lobe, doesn't really develop until people are in their twenties. So now you have television and this huge disorientation. So you have this ripple effect going across the sea of society and culture. This generation being disoriented, building up, television coming in and, and making a sort of universal culture of this generation. A culture which was in many ways separated from the culture of the parents of the older generation because of all the changes. The ones who came through the depression were one culture. The ones who came out of the end of the Second World War with this new disorientation and all of a sudden with television formed a unique culture of its own. And that culture blended across nations because of television. See, you could see what, what, how were people, what kind of dances were they doing here. You wanted to emulate those. The um, clothing and dances done in America were promoted the most because so many broadcasts and movies came out of North America. So young people in other societies and cultures wanted to emulate that. So you have this whole culture of young people who had serious doubts about the older generation because they were the ones who were identified with the Second World War and they were the ones who were identified with what turned out to be false propaganda. And also there was the move to the suburbs at the time and a lot of move from the country into, not always in the city, but into suburbs. The suburbs tended to flatten life. There was practically nothing for young people to consume their energies. The ones who have been on the farms, such as many of my generation, including myself, our energies were consumed in daily chores, milking cows, uh, mowing, cutting firewood, all these things consume a lot of our energies. Now you have this, this flattened out culture. <clears throat> and energies are occupied, well, by television, by younger people trying to find ways to entertain themselves, not the way you did on the farm, by like going into the forest and having exploring and hiking and having, um, you know, mock cowboy and Indians or Serbian and Turk, Serb and Turk battles or whatever. Uh, but they also got part-time jobs or full-time jobs sometimes, bought automobiles, gained a great deal of personal independence and freedom, stopped listening to a lot of what was being preached to them, which they could see was not true. The haranguing and all of the darkness that was being preached by so many ministers and preachers simply weren't true. And they knew it, that, that it wasn't true. So in the 60s, you saw this rebellion against the standards of a culture which was not trusted any longer. Many of us responded to that by traveling around the world. We began these great treks, which are commonplace now, but at the time they were quite rare. And the reason we did it, because we didn't believe the older generation or even television commentators about what was going on in the world. 
what other people were like and we wanted to see it for ourselves. So all of these dislocations, disorientations, this building up of a lack of trust in the older generation, these kind of ripples rippling across the sea. In, in the 60s, they struck a wall, they struck shore, and there began to be this building of this great tsunami. We found the hippie movement, which was a movement of distrust. Not nearly as radically immoral as a lot of people claim it was, but it was a wall of distrust. Then the Vietnam War came along, and the younger generation knew that this was an unjust war, that it should never have been fought, that thousands upon thousands of innocent people were being slaughtered for no particular reason in it. This is when the tsunami reached its peak and swept across the land in a great, uh, to a great degree. And when the body bags were coming back and we could see on television the horrors that were being wrought on innocent civilians, peasants in Vietnam, by the biggest power in the world. Of course, crime rates did spiral in that era. And they spiraled because the added disorientation of this younger generation, which had really come to age in the 60s and the 70s, spiraling up till the 80s when it began to taper off again. But so many of the things that were being preached by fundamentalists, Protestants, Roman Catholics, and within the Orthodox Church, helped to form the shoreline upon which another tsunami would break. And this was a moving away from taking for granted the things that were being taught within the religions. And part of that was this hysteria, a reborn hysteria from the 1800s, about Darwin and evolution and uh, the development of modern science and these things. People were preaching in the name of Christ things that were patently false and things which a younger generation knew very well were false. And we know that the earth is 4.5 million years old, okay, the dinosaurs were extinct millions of years before there were humans, that, the, the, uh, that mankind has developed over the last 200,000 years and particularly the last 75,000 years, all these things. Well, we have people online telling us, oh, this is not true, this is a lie. We have preachers, ministers, books being written by religious people telling us all of these things. And we also see the dark repression, fear, anger, and malice that develops among the sort of moral majority movement in the United States. Uh, you know, all of the people, the 700 clubs still, still there uh, babbling away with all kind of monstrous accusations against God, although they think they're justifying actions. Uh, Jerry Falwell, who was certainly the sorrow of all who joy. And uh, these movements formed the shoreline upon which this tsunami broke. None of these people, Dr. Dobson especially, I dare say, and Jerry Falwell as well, none of these people were capable of analyzing the ripples coming across the sea and analyzing what the real problems were. All they could do, as Hitler had done before, was to pick scapegoats and hammer away at various scapegoats. I think I mentioned once that I got a brochure during that era telling me that the collapse of the American family was a Zionist, international Zionist plot because the Jews wanted to destroy Christianity by destroying the Christian family. It was fascist class scapegoats see, to make us afraid of these people. Well, now the AIDS epidemic came along. Already a sufficient amount of distrust for the culture and society that had created the Vietnam War and that had made all these false statements, told all these lies in the name of Christ and God. And they told us this lie. God created the AIDS epidemic. And how did the younger generation receive that? What kind of monster, what kind of evil mind would create a plague like that, first of all? And secondly, even more monstrous, why would he create a plague that he had no control over, which would kill predominantly innocent people, 
some through blood transfusions, and all these innocent children with it. So now you see the moral majority of the religious right has made God look like an evil monster far worse than Satan, who is out of control and can't control his own creations. This added to all of these falsehoods about evolution and things like that, you know, preaching against science. That was a shoreline upon which a huge tsunami hit and broke and swept across the land. Now something interesting happens. When the AIDS epidemic is at its height, and the most visible victims of it in, in, in North America are the gay community, the suffering of the gay community brings out the best in millions of people. And they start to have empathy. They start to have compassion for the suffering. And now we find this huge shift taking place in society in North America because of empathy and compassion. Whereas the religious right are not preaching empathy and compassion, they're preaching fear, hatred, and malice. So you see this collision between what appears to be the malicious, almost evil-minded, mentality of the, of the religion that people are hearing most, that is the religious right, and the natural empathy and compassion which are within mankind because it's the image and likeness of God. So you have basically the image and likeness of God in mankind clashing with this idolatrous image that are being portrayed by right-wing Christians. Idolatrous image. The fundamentalists and evangelicals are portraying the idolatrous image of God that people had tried to struggle through in the Old Testament. And now evangelicalism and fundamentalism have picked up this idolatrous image of God and it becomes pitted against the image and likeness of God which is to be planted in mankind from his creation by God and contains this compassion and empathy while the others are preaching fear, hatred, and mass with their idolatrous image of God. This is a part of the whole problem. That to a certain degree, this kind of fundamentalist religion, and Islam in general, but fundamentalist religion is antithetical to democracy. In some ways it can preach democracy, but try to destroy democracy try to undermine it. Because one thing that fundamentalism and evangelicalism must fear above all is people being able free to think and to analyze and people becoming more and more educated. Education, freedom to think and analyze, and democracy. These are things that fundamentalism and this, the idolatries of evangelicalism cannot survive in the face of. So there's this panic now about this growth of, of uh, atheism. This panic now about the empathy that people have shown for the gay community, where 56%, I think, of Americans now are in favor of marriage equality and all that. One could have simply said, within the framework of their religion, we don't accept this community, we don't accept homosexuality, we consider it a sin, fine. But to start trying to persecute and harm and destroy people and say that God is out to get them or trying to destroy them rather than seek their healing, then people say, well, I know all these people who are gay who prayed to the point of tears, almost to the point of blood, to be healed and they weren't. Why? Is God lacking the power to do that? And on the other hand, we're having people say, oh well, just you know, like that it can be cured. Well, people find out these are lies and falsehoods. So what's, what's the point here of all of this now? Evangelicalism and fundamentalism are idolatries. 
They present an idolatrous image of God. They present an idolatrous teaching about hell. The idea that heaven and hell could be two different places is idolatrous. To say that God is not present everywhere and filling all things is idolatrous. To not stop and try to analyze what's actually going on in society and culture and respond to it in a way that can be healing and that can somehow turn back negative movements but to attack it with malice, with falsehoods, with a kind of evil mindedness is not going to win the moral battle. And what you're holding up as being moral can be unethical. And the law is going to change to reflect reality, not your idolatry. So we have to win people over with that kind of compassion and empathy by analyzing what the problem is. What are these ripples coming across the surface of the sea? What's the root of causing it? Don't build a landfall upon which these ripples can collide and create this tsunami that sweeps over the land. This is what evangelicals and fundamentals have been doing. And they've been doing it by becoming panicked and almost hysterical at everything new that appears in society and culture. By blaming God for some of the worst things that take place on the earth. Well, God caused an earthquake on the East Coast, uh, according to the um, great prophet of the 700 Club, Pat Robertson. And it only did a little bit of damage because God was only a little bit angry. Now, hundreds of thousands of innocent people have been killed, it would have been because God was very angry, not just a little bit angry. How do you expect an educated younger generation to respond to those kinds of accusations against God? God can create an earthquake, but he can't control it. He can't control who's going to get killed by it. It's not just going to be the people he wants to punish. It's going to be 99% of the people who perish are going to be the innocent. And then to go on about saying, well, evolution is falsehood, that the earth is 10,000 years old, things like this. How can you expect people not to become atheists when you teach things like that? Or when you respond to these modern issues by blaming God for everything, Blame, uh, literally blaming God for almost every evil thing that happens on the face of the earth by saying he's doing it to punish people or to wake people up. If God cannot win people over with kindness and love, an earthquake is not going to make people love or worship God more. But if they do believe to hate and despise him more, or to simply think he's much more out of, if he's that much out of control, he's not worth bothering with anyway. So you see, this is a problem to analyze and look at where these problems actually come from that are, we're facing. What those ripples are moving up as they are across the surface of the sea. And then blindly rushing in and making a landfall so you'll have the tsunami washing across the land. This is what I'm trying to convey to you people I'm trying to get at. People like Isakios, like uh, um, I don't know, the, the fellow who sends me the nutty notes or whatever his name is, and, and these other people who come on online, and no matter what they say, they see God as being essentially evil. And they see God as being essentially vindictive and malicious. Out of the fullness of their own hearts, because that's the way they are. And they think that God is created in their likeness and their image. The religious right is the primary cause of the growth of atheism in our day. And we'll continue this broadcast a little later on the same subjects. And we'll take up with, with your new questions that have come in. So thank you all and God bless you.